leaving for Kitty's church. A warm welcome. Good to have you here. Last week it was a bit rushed after the Convergence Conference. We had to link up with the guys in uh, South Africa with the live streams and make everything work. And I was so thankful, as I said, that all the live streams worked out. Otherwise, you have to uh, have a few sermons prepared to stand in if there's a signal or a Wi-Fi or electricity or something not working out. So we're uh, really good to have you here this morning. Daniel came to church before, before church. Daniel quickly came to me and he said, but uh, Pastor, I've got a, a short testimony I just want to share. And I believe it's so significant and important that uh, when there's something in our hearts and what God is doing, that we uh, allow that opportunity to hear what the Lord is doing in our lives, through our lives, and how we are building His kingdom. Daniel. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor, for giving me this opportunity to, to come and share my testimony with our brethren. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I'm just here to come and share my testimony with you. So my testimony, uh, my name is Daniel Mupurwa. So I've been in Chofa since 2015. I started attending the church, and uh, I became a, mem a member of Shofa in 2018. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm working as a literacy promoter since February in the Ministry of Education. So, uh, si since I went there, you know, I've I been uh, 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 eager to take my arts to the community. So, and then, wh when I was there, that's when uh, here at church, I started going to the prison uh, for the prison outreach under a digital small group. It was maybe 2017, somewhere there. But the first time when I was at the prison, you know, when I entered, I felt that, you know, the prison is a very difficult place to enter there. When we entered, you know, you feel like when you are there, someone can just come and hit you and kick you and ask you, what are you looking for? You know, something like that, the, the way you feel on your own. But the time when we were there, actually, it was something else. So I remember that time I was with Chris and uh, Mark Devet, the one who he was having his guitar there, you know, here in Soko prison. So... That's how I started going to the prison. But now, this year, with work, then I, I, I spoke to my leaders that, uh, you know, we have to reach out to every, to all the community, even people in the prison. We can reach out there with our um, classes or training. Then they agreed with that, and we went to Walvis Bay. It was July, Walvis Bay Correctional Services. We were there for a week giving art, art trainees whereby after, on Friday, then they presented their artworks, and it was awesome, according to the recommendation that we're getting from the commissioner and everybody there and what. So now, it happened again last week. My leaders, they told me that, no, now we are going to Maruru prison, so we're going to give art trainings there. So before we go there, actually, uh, so always they, there's a theme. When we went to the Walbisa prison, uh, so their theme they put it was uh, the tree from nature. So and then they asked me, or oh, oh, do you want to give any other theme? Then I said, no, yeah, the tree is fine, but uh, what if perhaps if we can say the tree of life? And then the tree of life, I just took it from Revelation 22, uh, verse 1 up to, because I learned about that in one of our encounter here in Shofa. So it, I was having a proper meaning of it. Now this time, they, they gave a theme again. They said, we're going there, but the theme of the mixed media that we want to talk about or teach is the Christmas tree. So be, before we go there last week, I rushed to, to, to Nobet and say, so it's like this, we're going to Amaruru, but now the theme there is the Christmas tree. Can you tell me, publicly, how can I say about the Christmas tree as a Christian? So Norbert shared me a little bit of things there, and then I said, okay, no, it's okay. Then we went there. So it, 
we went there on Monday. We gave the training until Friday. So we taught how they can use their pencils and mix their paints and come up with the artwork out of materials, newspapers, old cans, bottles, whatsoever. Because uh, actually, at, at the ministry, the materials were not given materials. Nothing. So no budget, no what. Even when we went to Wallis Bay, we, uh, one of my leaders, he pulled his money, 200. He bought a few paints. At least I, I said, we cannot go there with, without paints. So he bought small tubes. Even this time also, she bought small tubes. And the other rest, it was just raw materials or whatever we picked around. So we gave the training, and the training was awesome. Even the commission, he was so happy about the training. So the guys there, they were really happy. You know, uh, when I was there, really, I just felt that really God, he can use he can use someone through his gift or his work to a places where he couldn't reach himself. But through your work, you can go to places where you, you, you wish to go there, but you didn't know how. So that's how God used, used me or gave, gave me that uh, 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 power to go there also and preach to the, to the prisoners through the art trainings and the art artworks that we, we, we gave them training because the thing was we, we taught them to have confidence on their self and to respect themselves because when you first to respect yourself, that's how someone can respect you. If you don't respect, you go around the community, you kick people, you do what. So even if you can come up with a beautiful artwork, no one can buy from you because first of all, there has to be a connection from the one buying and the one selling. So that was that, and really the guys there, when we giving the training and afterwards, when they're presenting their artworks on Friday, you know, it was a, they were crying and, you know, regretting and saying, no, really this is, uh, we have never uh, uh, see this thing happening. Even the commission said, so keep it, keep coming and, so that's how we get the connections with the prisoners. So, so I'm now comfortable with the prison because unlike when I started, because I thought really I came to prison, but I don't think I can work in this place because I think I'm lying to God because my, my heart is not telling me I want to stay in the prison to bring, but now I'm really comfortable with going to wherever in prison. So that's what I wanted to share with you this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful just to listen to your heart and uh, how God is placing us at different places to uh, workplaces, prisons, wherever, to uh, be the light and to share the word. And uh, Daniel, I recall, you know, the last time we ministered together, it was in Korihas. And there's no difference between church in Korihas. I see Gisela is also here somewhere. No difference between having church in Korihas and Swakopmund. There's only one thing. It's always 40 plus degrees. Gorichas. It always feels like it's very, very hot. So, uh, yeah, that was good times. Let's pray together. It's Father, we come to you, Lord God, and we want to thank you for testimonies like this, Lord God. We want to thank you, Lord God, for opportunities, Lord God, through the gifts that you have placed in our lives, Lord, whether it's the arts or sports or education, Lord God, that there's an opportunity for us to reach out to people, Lord to share about what you have done in our lives, Lord God, to share scripture about Jesus Christ, Lord God. Now, Father, thank you for those opportunities, Lord God. And Father, as we will see today that, that you speak to us, Lord God, that you have always, always spoken to, to men and women about their callings, Lord God, about your kingdom, about giving them instruction, Lord God, about what you want to do in and through their lives, Lord God. Father, and yeah, Lord, I trust that our hearts will be open, Lord God, to what you want to say to us, Lord God. Yes, Lord God, that, that you speak, Lord God, that we should be sensitive, Lord God. All the distractions and the, the things of this world, the cares of this world, Lord God. Lord, that we will fight those things, Lord God. Yes, Lord God, and be often enough quiet and sensitive to listen to what you want to do. We praise your name. Amen. 
Amen. So it's good to be standing here. And I was just uh, reflecting a few years ago. I did a, um, a course which some of our senior Shofa pastors um, hosted about, uh, you know, uh, Christ-centered preaching. And I remember one of the modules were about, you know, about vulnerability in the pulpit. And, you know, what do you share and what do you don't share? Sometimes, you know, there's very personal, powerful testimonies. But, you know, where's that? type of a boundary that you, uh, um, stuff that you should maybe not share publicly, etc. And uh, this morning, well, I was, uh, as I was sitting here, you know, I was just uh, thinking about 20 years ago on this day, the 23rd of October, 2002, I was still on my way to hell. I, I have to say it, you know, I was definitely, if I had to die that day, I was still on my way to hell. I thought I'm okay, but I wasn't, because that next afternoon, the 24th of October, the gospel came to my ears, and Jesus came to my heart, you know, and it's now 20 years ago, um, I think if someone said to me on that 23rd of October 2002, you're going to stand in a pulpit and preach to people, I would have definitely laughed at them, and uh, the next day on the 24th, I would probably run away, <laughs> you know, I would probably run away just like uh, um, Jonah did, and, you know, God would wait somewhere with a big whale. But, you know, it's powerful that we can share these things because it's a reality in our lives to say that there was a time I have to, from where I'm sta standing right now, I have to be honest. And I wasn't in right standing with God, you know. But only through a classmate, there was no smoke machines, no worship machines, no pastors, no, no nothing. But the gospel is good enough. The gospel is powerful enough for a guy that knew the Lord only about six months more than, than I did at that stage to uh, share the very, very basic gospel about what Jesus did on the cross. And that was good enough. And uh, that's the things. That's why, thank you, Daniel. Um, you make my day in a sense to come and say, there's something I want to share about what the Lord is doing in my life and how he's using me and how he wants to use all of us. So this morning, I hope you are really prepared. I've got my Bible, my notes, slides, and a tablet. So uh, if the chicken is done by 12 o'clock in the oven, please send a message to someone. It's, we're going to be finished by one or something like that. But uh, just a little bit of feedback. We were in, in South Africa, the beautiful Boerland or the Western Cape or our pastor summit. Um, and uh, there between Wellington and Paul, there in the green vineyards and the beautiful mountains, and it was lovely to spend time there with our, our family, uh, co-leaders and pastors for a few days. Really, um, if there's one thing that I can, can come back and I can say that, that I left with, it's with a strong, strong unity feeling about what the Lord is doing in our midst and uh, that's powerful. Unity is a powerful concept in, uh, in God's kingdom. But you know what? Flying back, leaving the beautiful cave behind, coming here to Walfish Bay, said to my wife, this is home. This is home. This is where the Lord has planted us. And uh, I will probably share it in this sermon, but just a little bit of free advice, you know. Never ever say to God, I won't do something. Or I won't go there. Never ever say that. I was one of those guys about seven and a half years ago. I still said to God, no, living in Vindu, I will never come to Swakopmund. Now I'm here. And I've stopped saying stuff like that to God. So uh, sometimes we say to God, I will never stand in front of people. I will never share my testimony. I will never do this or never do that. God certainly has a way to take us to those places. Everyone who does that, I believe you have personal tears and experience why? Because he wants to, in a sense, break our own will, our own flesh, that we will go with what he wants to go, or what he wants to do in our lives. So as JP said, last week we had the Convergence Conference, um, we celebrated about 30 years of what God was, not what God was doing in Shofar, but how God used us as a church group to accomplish his plans and purposes through church planting, raising disciples, or making disciples, raising leaders, planting churches. And there was one very special moment on that Saturday evening. Um, one of the pastors did an altar call, and it was something we prayed before, um, because it's something we trust in God for, even at the pastor summit. 
um, you know, to see that when we talk about church planting, some might sometimes say, but, you know, there's so many churches in a place like um, Vinduk or Swakop or Namibia or South Africa, you know, and whenever you plant a church, you don't just want to move fish from one pond to another. That's, that's sheep stealing. We, we don't want to do that. It's a place where you want to really, through the gospel, reach communities that people that doesn't know Jesus Christ can come to salvation and a place where we can walk with them, disciple them, where they can receive healing, etc. And that Saturday night, we had an altar call. Um, now, just to give you a bit of background, if you weren't part of it, um, we had three venues, Somerset West and Pretoria. So all the live speakers did the presentations and sermons from those two, and we live streamed it to uh, a few venues. One of them was Swakop Munt. And you know what? On that Saturday evening, there was 151 people that responded on that altar call that was basically re sir, uh, regarding people that want to get involved with church planting. Now, whether it's prayer or giving, but specifically people who said, I'm willing to move with a group because we've just seen over the years, if you send just one person to wherever and you say, there's the Bible, we love you, we pray for you, go and plant a church, that's tough. But if you go in a group, you know, where there's different giftings and a bit of support, it makes it so much more healthy in a sense. So, you know, there were 70, uh, 151 people that responded. We're going to have a live Zoom meeting um, on, on Thursday evening, 7 o'clock. So for those of you who are here, that's probably news. I hope your diary is open. But uh, Pastor Heinrich would want to share a little bit with them. But you know what? 77 of those people, we gave them little cards and, and just how the Lord is, um, you know, speaking to them. Why? I mean, there's a call. Do you want to be involved? And I believe there's the conviction. Some wanted to be involved. And 77 of those people um, said, we want to put up or raise our hands to be equipped as church planters. Now, you know, even if just a third of those people, let's say 20, can be equipped and it works out, and 20 new churches can be planted. Wherever, across, I mean, when at the pastor summit, we those guys from London and the Netherlands and Namibia and all across South Africa. But praise God for people who still want to say, Lord, I'm, I'm willing. I may be scared, and I don't know what exactly it means, but, but I want to do that. There was, I think there was, a, we got the stats, 62 people that indicated and said, I don't feel I, I, I'm, I'm like called to be a pastor or a leader or a church planter. But 62 people said, I'm willing to be part of a group. I'm willing to move with a church planting group to wherever to support that plant. And I think it's awesome. Can we just say hallelujah? You know, it's, it's because it's about move, God's kingdom moving forward. And guess what? There were 20 people that lined up here. Do I lie? Where's the people that were here? Sian and Luan and all of you guys. 20 people responded. And whether it's for prayer or giving or support or church planting. Now you do the stats. 151 people. 20 people stood here. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to those who said, Lord, I'm willing to be the clay. I'm willing to be the clay. You are the potter. Shape me. Mold me. Um, I would love to, to be part of what God is doing. So... If you, if you don't know what to pray for, pray for those hands that said, Lord, I don't know how and where and when and what, but I'm willing to move, to move forward. So uh, it's always God drawing people to himself. You know, and, and, and I'm not going to share too much. Maybe next week I'll share a little bit. But uh, it's such a journey with God. I've something, and, and, and my one sister, which I'm looking at now, will know. There was something that really stole my my freedom, the peace in my heart on, on Friday morning, because sometimes stuff happens in church and like, oh God, why now? It's the end of the year. We don't feel like this and that. And, and it's been bothering me the whole weekend and I've been praying about it. But I, I want to share it. You know, this morning when I came to church and I sat here, I just experienced so much peace right here. And I hope you do as well. I hope you do as well. Because I believe God's presence dwell here. When I came back from the three month sabbatical, I think one of the things that, that I loved was just to see some of you. Yes, maybe we don't have a coffee every day or a braai every weekend or what. 
But to see so many of you, to listen to a Daniel that said, I became part of the family in 2015 and a member then and all of that. It's our family. And it's the same I feel towards the, the rest of our chauffeur pastors. Hey, who of you have got perfect families? There's nothing like that. Where's the people with the perfect marriages or the perfect kids, husbands or wives? There's nothing like that. There's no perfect churches. But I love my family. Amen. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Carol. I need it so much. You know, now come, you know, just to the message, I'm going to continue a little bit about the, the call, called and sent because that was the theme. And it's actually something I believe behind the scenes in terms of the gospel and all of that we've been praying about and speaking about as, as the elders specifically. But you know, it's dang, yeah, we need to always be careful when we say things about God's word. And I, I think I've read every little nook or cranny in terms of scripture. But you know, I don't think there's a chapter in God's word where God's not involved. Would that be a fair statement to make? There's not a chapter or a verse that's not somehow inspired. You know, otherwise it wouldn't have been there, you know. And right through scripture, we will see interaction between God and man or man and man. You know, there were wars between men and stuff between people. But God is always involved in our lives. So this morning I want to, uh, um, I want to start and I want to look first. I'm going to look because I call the, the sermon, if you go to the next slide, Ed and John, if you go to the next, then the Lord said. Now I remember one of the things that was probably the weirdest to me. Maybe you can relate this morning. 20 years ago when I came to Christ, in, in that first week I went to a small group. And the small group, some of the people were talking about the Lord showed me and the Lord said, it's like, what do you mean? I, I, I honestly have never felt in the first 22 years of my life that God spoke to me about anything. Yeah, I went to church, you know, I read scripture, but, but yo, I don't know, I, I never perceived God like that, you know. And that changed in the past 22 years. Yeah, God speaks to the pastors. Thank you. Thank you, God. You're so good. But, you know, I called it, then the Lord said, because do you know how often you see those few words in Scripture? Go and study. How often you will find it said, and then God said, or, and then God spoke. So, there's a place I want to go to, and there's something I believe that, that, that uh, a place where we need to end today. So, uh, that means we need to start somewhere. So, I want to start this morning with Genesis uh, chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13, no, I'm lying, sorry. Genesis chapter 6, um, from verse 13 onwards. That's the next slide. I, may, I underlined a few things to make it quite clear. I hope you can all see up there. And you know the narrative about um, God speaking to, to Noah and the flood. And I'm not going to go into too much detail. I believe it's a relatively well-known portion of Scripture. But I believe there's a few specific things that I want us to, to look at. And I believe that's the things that God laid on my heart for this morning. And then in verse 13 it says, And God said to Noah, Now, the world will always tell us that God doesn't speak, or God doesn't exist, or God, God doesn't love. There's so much stuff happening in the world, God does, and all of those stuff. But here it says in the Word, in the Holy Scripture, it says, And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Now you see, and God said, you know, it's God spoke, God speaking. And as I said, you will find those few words so often, especially in the Old Testament. And then it says, I have determined. You know, church, God is in control of history. God is the Alpha and the Omega. I love to pray that always just like, God, you are everything. God, you are sovereign. God, you are so big. It says, I, God, have determined to do something. There's something that God wants to do. And when God wants to do something, it's not like us where we try sometimes. God's plans and purposes will come to pass. And he continues, so God has got a plan. And the beautiful thing that we see throughout Scripture, I believe, and, and you can go and study it, is that God always calls a Luan. Or a Matthijs, or a Valerie, or a Carol. And he says, but, or a Daniel, and says, Daniel, but 
are you willing? I want to use you in prison. Person, I want to use you here in the worship team. I want to use you in the children's church. Knock, knock, I want to use you. And here God comes to Noah and he says, and he, and he tries to reveal his plan and what he wants to do. He says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark are 300 cubits, its breadth, etc. And then there's a whole um, uh, explanation or instruction about what he wants to do. God spoke. He said, I have determined there's something that God wants to do as a sovereign, powerful God. And then there's an instruction where he speaks to his, to his sermon. Someone God chose. Now, here it says, I think, that, that um, Noah was righteous in the eyes of God. And God chooses as he likes to. Okay? And then God always, or usually, he, after the instruction, he gives a lot of detail. Just look at Moses in the tabernacle or here with the ark. There's a lot of stuff where God says, I want you to do something. I want you to, do, to build something. It's going to be this big. It's going to be this long. This is how you're going to do it and all of that. And you know what? If you continue and you can go and study or read that narrative or scripture, the text at home, in, in Genesis chapter 6 verse 22, it says, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Wow. God's heart must have been pleased. There's nothing where Noah tried to flee or run away or said, God, I cannot do this. It says twice that Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him to do. Now, if you read through all that story, well, if, if Noah didn't want to do it, God probably would have chosen someone else and Noah would have died in the flood. So it was his salvation. It was his, it preserved life literally in that sense. So, there's an there's a example um, yeah, about how God spoke to Noah. Then I want to go on and I'm just going to use a few examples as an illustration for us to see a truth. Something that God always does and is still doing. If we go to Exodus, now this is an awesome story. I really love it for various reasons. Um, and it's in scripture for a reason. God placed it there by design. It's not like a, to fill the pages. God wanted the story to be here. And there's always, always something for us to learn in every... That's why the word says you cannot remove anything from the scripture. Otherwise, there will be a curse on you. Exodus chapter 3, it's Moses and the burning bush. Well-known story. Um, I'm not going to read all of it. Chapters, uh, ch uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. Read with me. I've also underlined a few things there. And it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now I'm going to pause there. How often, in especially the Old Testament text, the New Testament, we might probably get to that next week. We'll see. It says that, God spoke to someone, or God appeared to someone, or an angel of God appeared to someone. That's, that's what we usually see. That's the way that God interacted and he said, I want to show you, I want to talk to you about something. There's something I want you to do. God didn't just took the Israelites, the Hebrew people, out of slavery in Egypt. He just didn't do it. He used someone as his vessel to accomplish something. And there were men with these strong callings, the, the judges, the Samsons, the Davids, the Sauls, all of them um, in Scripture, in the Old Testament especially, um, the Gideons, etc. But you know what? Remember in the New Testament church, it's not just pastors that are sent to, to, to jail. Now, that's a weird sentence. Maybe we should just clarify. We went to minister in jail. It's any one of us. Daryl and, and so many of you guys weekly go to the prison to, to minister there to the inmates, etc. But here God is choosing a specific person. And it says there in verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And I underlined it because it's a, it's a, recurring, uh, a recurring theme, I almost want to say. God revealing something um, to a person. God appeared to him in a flame 
of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Verse 3, And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And then in verse 4, I underline it, it says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God, God called to him out of the bush. Now, I love the way that the author or how this text says something. And I believe it's exactly the same way that God is still looking at us. You think that God can see what we are doing? Scripture teaches us, the New Testament, that he knows about the hair on our head, the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Okay? So, I believe with all my heart today, 20 years later, that God knows exactly about our thoughts he created our minds. He created our hearts. He gave us the ability to walk and to all our organs to work together. He knows about our thoughts. That's what scripture teach, teaches us. And here it's beautiful. When the Lord saw, okay, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God said, I'm going to bring you more. I'm going to bring you even closer. And then God, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am once again. Then he said, do not come closer. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And church, there's not always a burning bush. There's, there's not always thunder or lightning. But you know, I believe if I give the uh, opportunity today, many, 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 hopefully most of you will be able to testify, you know, how there was a time and a place where there was a similar experience in your life. God calling you, um, and almost as if God is watching and see, will Sander now take this step closer? And when he takes that step closer, God is like, now I want to engage with you. I want to speak to you. And you know what I can say for a fact? When you read scripture, study scripture. It's almost never that God speaks to you about your fourth car, your tenth house, that Mauritius holiday, your riches. I don't see that in God's word. Now, I'm not saying this morning, you cannot say, God, I'm trusting you for a house, a car, a holiday. I'm not saying that. But when God speaks to man, the God of the universe, when God speaks to man, it's about his plans and purposes. It's about what he wants to accomplish. And here we go. We continue in verse 6. And he said, I am the God of your fathers. God is identifying himself. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Once again, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their task, taskmasters. Now, there's a long narrative, once again, that, that you are probably relatively familiar with, Go and read it, go and study it. But you see, there's something that I can relate to, and maybe many of you can, will be able to relate to as well. What happens next? There's a conversation between God and Moses, okay? And we've got it here to learn from it. What has Moses, now I underline that part where Noah, where, where Scripture tells us, and Noah did everything God commanded him to do. What did Moses do? You are, you, you are allowed to speak in church, a hand or two. What did Moses do right after where I stopped now? What did he start to do? Hands, please. Come on, church. He spoke back. Yes, what did he say? Oh, not, not, not what exactly, but more or less. Where, what, what was this Moses' reaction? He couldn't do it. He could. All, okay, okay, okay. It sounds like. You've been there, maybe. Okay? Yes, a lot of excuses. And when you go and read through it, it's, it's like, you know, sometimes parents in the house, the lawn needs to be mowed, or the car needs to be washed, or the, the, the dustbin needs to be taken out, and I'm too sick, or I'm too tired, or I'm too busy now. Then school works is a big priority, or, or stuff like that. But Moses actually started with the dialogue, and about, as you, all, as you guys said, about, no, 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 God. Not me. No, it, it can't be me. What will the people say? Um, I'm not going to read all of it because it's, it's, it's going to take way too long. 
But there's one or two points I want to highlight. Because there's something we can learn. Moses became such a strong leader in many ways. God did powerful, powerful things through his life. But right there at that place of calling, it says even in verse 14, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Because Moses was so giving so many excuses why God should not use him. God had to take him through a few exercises about the snake. And, you know, that his, his staff that turned into a snake. And he needed to show him about his um, arm that he had to place. And it, it, became, it became leprosy, etc. And Moses said, uh, in verse 10, Then Moses said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, I'm not, a, I'm not eloquent, neither before, uh, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. But I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Moses is now trying, Lord, but they will recognize me. Lord, but this is not going to happen. And uh, I'm reading here from the New King James, and when I read it, um, now the New King James flow, for obviously from the Old King James, and someone, something like the ESV Bible that I use most of the time also come from this bloodline, if I can call it, of translation. But it's beautiful in a sense how the New King James still states it. Um, and, uh, and here in verse 12, after Moses said, I'm slow to speak and all of that, you know, in verse 12 it says, Now therefore go. And I will be with your mouth and teach you what you should say. Moses, okay? Moses, I will be with your mouth. That's not the way we speak exactly today. But it's like, Moses, like, God is like, okay, Moses, I will be with you. I will be with your mouth. If your mouth is an issue to you, guess what? I'm bigger than that. I will use it. Okay? So, and, and then the narrative continue. You can, you can go and read it at home. But there's so much about Moses hesitating, and then Moses probably saw some of the most amazing uh, portions of Scripture or, or things that God did. He received the Ten Commandments. He saw manna. He saw the tabernacle and God's presence. He see the, saw the Red Sea open. I mean, there's powerful, powerful stuff. He saw the Ten Plagues, all of those things playing out, massive stuff. But it's almost as if Moses stumbled over this first hurdle, in a sense, and, you know, church, I'm, I'm speaking today in the context of, of being called. And I believe with all my heart, I've got the freedom and the liberty to say today, and I'll end there probably, you know what? God is calling all of us for something. Maybe speaking today about your, your marriage, being a husband, a wife, a father, maybe you're here and you're a child. Maybe he, speak to you, he will be speaking to you about obeying your parents. Maybe he's speaking to you about ministry or church, or going, or something like that. I believe that God will do that. And I believe that God wants to take some of us back to stuff that He has spoken to us about previously. And these examples are just examples in, in the biblical narrative that we can learn from other people and how they interacted. Let's go to Jonah, a very well-known story in Scripture. I haven't read it for a while, and it was actually a joy for me in the past week to, to just look at it again. Jonah, Jonah, those scriptures will not be up there, sorry, it's a, I added a bit later on. Jonah chapter 1, it starts with and it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, once again, speaking. God was speaking, okay? Arise and go. Point B, or secondly, how often you will see in scripture that after God spoke, there's a command, go. I saw it. Go, go, and, go and look at a few examples. So often, God they didn't just add this talks about, that, about nothing. God spoke with purpose. God spoke with vision. And, gone, and here we can see it again. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. For the evil has come up before me. Now here we need to ask ourselves, am I a little bit of a, a Noah? Am I a bit of a Moses? Am I a bit of a, of a Jonah? In verse 3 it says, But Jonah rose to flee to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa to find a ship going to Tarsus, so he paid the fare and went down to it to go, uh, to go with them to Tarsus away from the presence of the Lord. Now if you were in those circumstances, what would you say to Jonah? Let's, let's open it up. What would you say to Jonah? Jonah, 
Hanivarki, donkey. It's not going to work. You cannot flee from God's presence. You cannot flee from something that God is speaking to you about. We were once actually, we, uh, when was that? It was I think three years ago, we had a, at the Brandberg White Lady Lodge, we had the, the young workings, we had a camp. And uh, one lady drove with a, a small little car, which was probably not made for the road from here to um, Brandberg. And I said to you, once we stopped against, uh, along the road, and I asked her, but listen, is this little car, isn't it rattling a lot? And she said, yeah, I just turn up the music a bit, and I don't hear all this <laughs> skit skit and all of that. But you know, isn't that what we sometimes do in life? You know, God is like putting his finger softly on your heart. You need to start serving. You need to join small group. Not the pastor saying, God will speak to us about those things. What do we do? We turn up, we turn up the music a bit exercise a bit more, work a bit harder, I'm so tired, you know, that's what we tend to do, I'm honest, I, I, I know, I've, 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 I've been in church now for a long time, that's usually what we do, we're like, no, maybe, maybe it's not me, my mouth, or I've got this disability, or a reason, that's what exactly what these men also did, he tried to flee from God, verse 4, it says, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, you probably know the rest of the story. The ship was in trouble, um, and it sank. And I'm skipping quite a bit now. I'm just uh, running through it a bit. Verse 17, and it says, And the Lord appointed a great fish, fish to swallow up Jonah. You know that part? Then in chapter 2, it starts, and it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I call out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Okay, it continues, J Jonah get out of the, out of the fish, and uh, in verse 10 in chapter 2 it says, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Okay, massive experience, a lot of us are like, God, how does that work, what fish, how can it swallow up, and we go into all those details. Well, God created man, God created the universe, he created sand and molecules, and massive stuff and small stuff, that's the God we serve and this is what scripture teaches us. And then here is the crux probably for me in verse, in chapter 3. It says, then the word of the Lord, just like before, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against its message that I tell you. What happens next? Lona, ach, Lona. Jonah learned something. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of God. Jonah was like, I'm not going to go through all of this, being shipwrecked, being inside a, the big fish and all of that. And church, there's a lesson for us in that. Because very often, including myself, you know, there's times or seasons like, God, I can't speak to those people in Nineveh. They are too evil or it's too far, too cold, too hot. I'm too busy. We are very similar on a micro level in many ways. Let's just be honest about it. And here it's beautiful when it says the word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah. And we see Jonah didn't um and ah again. He didn't have a lot of stuff. He was, Jonah arose, he went to Nineveh. And you know, he did a massive altar call. The king and all the people, they actually repented. Um, you know, and, and it says they, they cried out to God, and it was, it was beautiful how they turned away from evil. But you see, so the message, once again, God coming to a Noah, God coming to uh, a Moses, God coming to a Jonah, and he's like, listen, there's something I want to teach you. There's something I want to use to you. Last example of many, many, many that we can use this morning. Gideon, okay, you can already probably see where this is going, but I want us to look in the mirror. I believe God wants us to look in the mirror, because if you walk into, into the foyer at the start, you will still see the timeline of all the shofar churches that have been planted. I know a lot of those men, and the wives for that matter, that planted th those churches. They were young, inexperienced, not perfect. But they said yes to the call. Okay. It takes a long time to become a mature, experienced leader in church. It just doesn't happen overnight. But it starts somewhere. It starts with always God 
knocking on our hearts, speaking to us. And you know what? I've, I've said it to people. Personally, I hate manipulation. I hate it when people want to manip manipulate me into anything. I will just resist it. Okay? But you know what? I'm not trying to manipulate to you to do something this morning. I'm just showing you what I see in Scripture. How God Almighty interacted with man, with people. Judges chapter 6, verse 8 to 18. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Oprah. Now that's not the Oprah you know, okay? The other <laughs> Oprah. Which belonged to Joaz, the Abazite, Abazarite, whatever. Um, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I underline it there once again, because in all these stories, in all these narratives, go and look, go and study for yourself, go and look at, 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 at the, the word is filled from beginning to end with these um, examples. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Verse 14, and the, Lord, and, and the Lord turned to him and said, Amen. I guess I'm making the point um, at this stage. Once again, go to, to, um, to uh, um, Jonah. He said, arise. To Moses, said, he, to Moses, he said, go to the elders of Israel. And then the whole Exodus journey with all the plagues and stuff were to unfold from there. And here he says, go. There's instruction. God spoke. And then he gave instruction, go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? It's powerful, okay? And once again, this fallible man, like all of us, is like, no, 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 God, this cannot be. And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Which is obviously true, you cannot, but God wants to use you. Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Okay? Once again, no, 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 Lord. Choose something strong, someone stronger. Choose. But you see, it's always about what God wants to do. It's not about my qualities, or Lionel's qualities, or Gerard's qualities. Yes, we should be righteous and fear God and, and obey Him and walk after Him. Okay? But it's about big picture, about God's plans, about God's purposes, okay? He, he doesn't just go and do something. God always calls one of us, even if it's to intercede for something. And here we see it once again, Gideon responding and saying, but sure, Lord, this, is, this cannot be. And, and there, the powerful part in verse 16, and the Lord said to him, but I will be with you and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Now, that's probably the third point. God speaking, God appearing, God revealing, or an angel appearing. Then there's instruction. There's something that God wants the person to do, a place he wants the person to go. And yes, we see in verse 16, and the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. What does Jesus promises the church? I will be with you. I will be with you until the end of the age. I will, there's about, there's a few times in the New Testament and the Old that, that God says, but not just Moses or Noah or Gideon, he will be with you, okay? Call on my name. Ask me for help, okay? I will be with you. JP, you guys, the band, you can uh, please come up. So I think what we can clearly see here um, as we talk about God calling us, you know, I think God speak, God give instruction. He says, go and do something. And then it is the, the place where there's either uh, 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 um, a Noah, which the word so beautifully says, and he did everything that God commanded him to do. Or there's the, the Moses account, the Jonah account, the Gideon account. And guess what? At the end, God used all of those men powerfully. I mean, the story of the ark is, is, is one about saving humanity. Um, taking, taking the Israelite people out of slavery, out of Egypt, to the promised land. It's a long, long story of trial and error and suffering and all of that, in a sense. Okay? But God used Moses powerfully. 
there with Jonah, we see a lot of people repenting, turning from the evil. And with Gideon, we see how God says, listen, I'm not going to give you the biggest, strongest army. You know, go and read about the men men that had to to lap like a dog and drink. And he made the army smaller and smaller. Why? That Gideon or Moses or Noah could get the honor and he's the man? No. The honor and the glory belongs to God. So I want to encourage this morning, okay, and say that God doesn't use perfect people. He uses willing people. And if you are here this morning and you feel a little bit like a Noah or, or maybe let's say rather a Jonah or a Gideon or a Moses, Lord, my speech, Lord, my English, Lord, my Afrikaans, my scripture, knowledge, anything like that. In a sense, I want to say to you, it's okay. Go and wrestle with God. But don't try and do the Jonah thing and run from God. It's not going to work. God will bring you back to that place. You know why? That's how God works. He wants to teach us. He wants us to, he wants to break us in a sense. Our own will, that thing that says, I will never do this. I will never go there. Okay? God wants to kill that cancer in our lives until we get to a place of clay. We, we use the pot and we are the clay and like, God, I, I honor those, I think, 62 people who said, I will go and support the church plant. I, I'm honest. I'm not the lead pastor or the lead person, but I'm willing to leave where I'm at and go with a group of people and support. They're not responding to Shofar. They're not responding to a specific pastor. They are responding to God's call. And the simple, plain, but challenging thing this morning is, what is God calling you to? What is God calling you to? What is God speaking to you about? And what will your response be? Plain and simple. Okay? No smoke machines. No weird stuff. Okay? And I believe with all my heart, even if it's to start exercising, even it's, if it's start to get a few disciplines right, even to have quiet time, I know that God would be speaking to you about something. On Thursday morning, I think it was Thursday morning, uh, a person in church, we're not marketing, it's, it's the end of the year, we're not marketing um, Bible school in, in, uh, right now, but someone phoned me or left me a voice message and said, but listen, I, I feel I want to do Bible school, and obviously you can do the online version, you can do it in your own time, how does it work, etc., etc. And I said to the person, you make my day. You know why? We haven't been speaking about Bible school right now or been marketing it. We will probably be do, doing that January next year. But you know what? I know one thing. God has been speaking to that person about studying His Word, growing in something, and God is preparing him. And I, I just love that. I'm just like, thank you, Lord. We can just be a channel here. It's between Him and God in many ways. So can we just stand this morning? Um, so I hear this morning, I'm gonna, and I just want to always extend that invitation. If you are here, you've heard about church and the gospel and the good news and about Jesus Christ saving, and miss, maybe listen to that testimony part where I said I knew where I was going to hell, and then a day later something happened, and I said, now I know I'm a child of God. If you are here this morning, and you feel that the Lord is really speaking to you about salvation, salvation is about responding to the gospel, responding to the good news, about dying to self, saying, Lord, I want you to live in my life. If you feel the Lord is speaking to you about something like that, please don't leave, okay? We would love to pray with you. So I'm going to stand there. We're going to worship together. And I trust the faithful Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts, okay? If you want to come to the front and you need prayer, leaders in the church, please remain here, and then we will pray with people. The Lord bless you. Faith and all is served away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's awkward that will bless your heart. And I'll bring you more than a song. A song in itself, it's not what you have required. You 
search much deeper within through the way things appear you looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship it's all about you it's all about you jesus 